Let's take our Bibles tonight and open up with me to 2 Corinthians as we continue our study. Uh, going through this book, 2 Corinthians tonight, and uh, we are still in chapter 2, and we start in verse 5 tonight, so you might want to put a marker here. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, as we resume this study in 2 Corinthians, entitled Sufficient Grace. I think it would be beneficial tonight as we begin uh, to just review the uh, reminder of the definition of the word grace, because as we've gone through this book, and especially especially with the topic that we will look at tonight, uh, we have to recognize just how desperately grace is needed uh, to do what we're going to be looking at. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. One of the best-known definitions of grace is only three words, God's unmerited favor. Tozer said, grace is the good pleasure of God that inclines him to bestow benefits on the undeserving. We know that we are saved by grace through faith, and so grace is how salvation comes about. But it's not where it stops. Once we accept the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, grace does not end. The necessity of grace does not end, but rather as a believer in Christ, not only are we saved by grace, but we are supposed to live by grace. That's what makes tonight's topic uh, so very, very important. Because if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have experienced God's grace. You have experienced the forgiveness of your sins. And so tonight's topic that the Apostle Paul is going to deal with is the grace to forgive. And put this together with the topic that we are looking at on Sunday mornings, dealing with revival. One of the hindrances to revival is a spirit of unforgiveness. If there is unforgiveness among God's people, if there is even an unforgiving attitude and a heart towards uh, others uh, that aren't saved, that aren't in the family of God, that is going to be a hindrance to revival. Dr. John R. Rice, a great evangelist, he's been home now with the Lord uh, for a lot of years. He was the founder of the Sword of the Lord. Uh, he was asked to preach revival meetings at a Baptist church in Woodbine, Texas. And this was a church, and the church had a lot of stuff going on, that he really never found out exactly what all the problems were. But the strife, the grief was so great in that church that it had absolutely broken the pastor's heart, and the pastor had resigned. He had left the church. The powers that be that remained, they wanted to see revival in the church, but they knew that it, as long as these people kept the attitudes of unforgiveness that they had, and there was so much animosity among the people within that church, it had spread out in the community. The community knew that there was people fighting and squabbling within that church that were just flat out angry with each other. You almost wonder why they didn't just move on, find another church, poison some other place. But instead, they stayed right there, which I guess is kind of good. They kept the poison in-house. But you would imagine that as they came to the church, as they sat on opposite sides of the, uh, of the, the church, you know, they kind of were looking for a fight every single service. Well, Dr. Rice, as he went and he preached there, he was preaching on God's love and God's forgiveness and all the things that you would expect an evangelist to come and preach on. And the people, it was interesting because his preaching was so good and it was so on point that for a week, they stopped being angry with each other so they could be angry with him. They were furious. How dare this, this foreigner come in and meddle in their, in their strife? And so they began to get angry with him. And one day, there was a woman. Uh, she picked up the phone, and she was going to call Brother Rice, and she was going to give him a piece of her mind. How dare he preach what he'd been preaching? And as she's picking up that phone to dial that number, her son, a 19-year-old boy, says, Mom, no, you're wrong. We've been wrong. He says, I've been out in the woods, and he says, I've been praying, and he says, I've been asking God to break not only my heart and to make things right between me and others, but to break the heart of our church family. He says, Mom, he says, don't make that call. He says, you're totally wrong. That night, Brother Rice got and that woman, she didn't make the call. She listened to her 19-year-old son. And she hung the phone up. That night in the church service, Brother Rice, after the song leading was done and just before he got ready to preach, he asked the question. He said, who's got a word of testimony they'd like to share tonight? And one dear lady stood up in the middle of that service. And instead of giving a word of testimony, she looked across the auditorium to another woman. And she began to pour out her heart. And she says, I have wronged this woman. And this is what I've done. And you all know about it. And she says, I beg for your forgiveness. With tears streaming down her face, she asked before everybody for their forgiveness. 
and asked that lady for her forgiveness. That woman left the side of the auditorium that she was on and came to the other. And right there in the middle of the service, those two ladies got things right with the Lord and with each other. And they cried over each other. Oh, you know what that started? It started revival. And as that service progressed, more and more people began to publicly confess their sin and get things right with each other. And revival broke out in that church. You know what? Just as, as much as the bad news traveled, so did the good news. And people wanted to find out what's going on in that little Baptist church in Texas. And all of a sudden, that church became filled every night. And as believers came in, revival settled on their soul. And, and sins were confessed and sins were forgiven. And you know what happens when revival takes place in the heart of believers? The lost get saved. Not because of revival to them. They needed evangelism. But when they see the power of God doing a work in the heart of believers, something changed. And all of a sudden, those lost people heard the gospel message as it was presented, and they started getting saved. So you got the, the, the deadbeat Christians are coming alive and, and, getting, and, and getting revived. You've got the dead that are coming to life. Wow. Wouldn't it have been awesome to have been at that church in Woodbine, Texas? Well, you know what, folks? We can't go back to the past. We can only live in the present, and we could have revival too. You know, we have to believe tonight that God is still in the revival doing and bringing business. But if we have hearts that are unforgiving, revival's not going to come to an unforgiving heart. The same grace that saved us is the same grace that will allow us to forgive those who have hurt us, those who have offended us. And as we look at this tonight, 2 Corinthians chapter five, or chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 5, we see Paul calling to this church and he says, But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. So that contrary wise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him, for to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Tonight, let's start out by looking at the sadness of sin. The sadness of sin there back in verse 5, the sadness of sin, if any have caused, if any, if I have, if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Grief. The sadness of sin. Keep a, a finger here, put your marker here tonight. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Most Bible commentators believe that the person that this, this passage here in 2 Corinthians is talking about is this individual back in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And when we studied 1 Corinthians, I mean, this is just immorality at its worst. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the first two verses says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Jump to verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. The sadness of sin. Oliver B. Green writes this. He said, It is possible that the father had lost his first wife, the boy's mother, and had then married a younger woman. Whatever the circumstance in the home, the young man had fallen in love with his stepmother, and the two of them had entered into a relationship which would be frowned upon even among believers and certainly should not be tolerated among Christians. Before Paul's reprimand, it would seem that the church of Corinth was accepting of it. That they didn't see anything wrong with it. In fact, they were glorying in it. How in the world is that possible? But yet they were. And so when the Apostle Paul addresses them, he says, your glorying is not good. You need to be grieving over this sin. You need to have broken hearts over this sin. 
It needs to be doing something inside you that's, that's breaking you down because it is a sin against the holiness of God. Turn with me in your Bibles to James chapter 4. Paul's reprimand evidently worked. And we know that God used Paul's words to reach their hearts. We know that it was from God that brought this grief to them. But in James chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, James chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. You know, just imagine for just a moment what could happen if believers in Christ found the sadness of sin. If they realized that we are supposed to grieve over sin. We get worked up over a lot of stuff. We get worked up over the political nonsense that's going on in our world right now. We get worked up over all the pandemic stuff and all the people on all sides of the fence and all the different messages and everything else. And we get so worked up about it. When was the last time we got worked up about sin? When was the last time that we got so fired up, broken hearted in our, because of our own sin and because of the sin that we see in this world? When was the last time that we were moved about sin? And yet Christians so often, we see sin going on all around us. It's on the television and everything else, and we call it entertainment. We call it just people living their lives, and yeah, I don't agree with that, that's terrible, but Folks, it ought to break our hearts. Every sin is a sin against God. You remember when David confessed his sin? He says, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Why? Because God's the one who determines what sin is. You know, you and I don't determine what sin is. We really don't. And a lot of people think that, that we do. It's like, no, God determines what sin is. His word lays down the principles that define what sin is. When anything breaks the law of God, that's sin. And it ought to break our hearts, starting with our own heart and then moving on to, to desiring to see the hearts of the church as a whole broken over it, the sadness of sin. Now, go back to 2 Corinthians and notice what we see here, chapter 2, verse 6. The second point tonight is the sufficiency of the punishment. The sufficiency of the punishment. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was afflicted of many. You say, well, what punishment? All right, back to 1 Corinthians 5. Back to 1 Corinthians 5, just bouncing between these two passages here. Starting in verse 3, Paul says, For I verily, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath done so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. The sufficiency of the punishment. The idea of a church invoking church discipline and dealing publicly with sin is something that is foreign to the hearts and the minds of the average church all across America. Uh, a fellow by the name of Mark Early, he was the president of uh, Prison Fellowship Ministries. That's what Chuck Colson had started. Uh, he was president from 2002 to 2010. He wrote this, he says, Why should anyone join a church and then expect to be permitted to flout its authority? After all, for failing to attend enough meetings, you can be thrown out of the Rotary Club. Violate the dress code and you'll be tossed out of the country club. If you don't perform community service, you can be kicked out of the junior league. I don't have any idea what that is. Yet the minute churches impose discipline on their members, they're charged with everything up to and including fascism. Shouldn't the church have at least the same right to set its own standards as a country club? If people don't like them, they're free to leave, assuming they're members in the first place. Whether church members like it or not, the church must discipline its members. As Chuck Colson and Ellen Vaughn warn, when we fail to discipline, the church does not become more relevant to the world around us. It simply loses its moral authority. Perhaps the church is in the condition that it's in today in part because the church has not practiced Matthew chapter 18. 
Matthew chapter 18 is the passage of Scripture that deals with church discipline. What is church discipline? Actually, when we say church discipline, the whole discipline process is something that you should never get to the point of it being church discipline. It's supposed to start out between the offender and the offended, one-on-one. And then if they won't listen, two or three to one. And if they won't listen, you bring it to the church. And if they won't listen, then exactly what the Apostle Paul said As the individual is is booted out of the fellowship, the protection, that safety net of their church family, they are excommunicated, to just use a a commonplace word. I think we've gotten a little bit gun-shy, though, about approaching this topic because inevitably there are some that, that start sharpening their knives as soon as you start talking about church discipline. And they're going, okay. You know, they they strap on their badge and their red and blue lights and everything else. They're just anxious to pull somebody over. And we're going to just, here we go. And they just beat a devil out of every corner kind of a thing, whether he's there or not. And so we get a little bit gun shy about it because you've always got somebody or some bodies that just are like that. When you look at this passage of scripture, you are dealing with something that is absolutely gross, heinous sin. I would say that incest is a pretty gross, heinous type of a sin. And something like that going on within a church family, that has got to be dealt with in a public fashion. It has got to be dealt with scripturally, biblically, strongly. You don't dance around that thing. Um, Maybe somebody comes in and they say, well, I don't like that person's uh, hairstyle. I don't like that person's, the color they wear all the time. We need to take that to the church. No, you don't. Knock it off. I mean, that's just some ridiculous stuff. I'm just coming up with stuff off the top of the head. I don't know. You know, people will come up with goofy things sometimes. They think that, oh, wait, this has got to go before the church. No. When you look at this in the Scripture, that was something that was reserved for the grossest violations of God's Word. So tonight, as that church family, as they dealt with that which uh, Paul had addressed in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we're ready for the third point. And the third point is the sweetness of restoration. The sweetness of restoration. There has to be the sadness of sin, the sufficiency of the punishment. Paul says it's sufficient. What you have done has been effective. And by the way, and we'll get to this at the end, but I'm coming to it right now anyways. The sufficiency. Why was it sufficient? Because it had accomplished its goal. What was its goal? I'll tell you about that in just a second. Stay awake. All right, the sweetness of restoration. Let's look at verses 7 through 9 in 2 Corinthians again. So that contrary wise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also I did write that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. This is so absolutely important. The sweetness of restoration. The sweetness of restoration, punishing somebody, that's the easy part. It really is. Forgiveness, healing, restoration, that's the hard part. And you know what's even harder? Doing it with the right attitude. Keep a marker here. Let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Hebrews, chapter 12. Look with me, starting in verse 5. Because parents, how many of you parents disciplined your children? Hallelujah. Light them up, right? Amen? Okay. Uh, you, and, and if you're sitting here and you're a modern parent and you're off in la-la land, you don't know how to do that, read your Bible. Does God light us up as his children? Absolutely. 2 Corinthians 5, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? The right attitude. Does our heavenly Father chasten us with love? He loves us enough to discipline us. He loves us enough to light us up. But He loves us enough to love us after we've been disciplined. And that's that's the big, big difference. Because there are parents in this world, oh yeah, they'll light their kid up. But then give their kid the cold shoulder afterwards. 
and kind of push their kid off to the side. So not only has the kid been punished, now they've been punished again. And, and Paul would say, sufficient is the punishment you gave them. Now love them. But before you can do that, forgive. The first thing that the Apostle Paul says that we have to do is forgive. Let's look at some Bible verses before giving out the explanation here. Go with me to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3 verse 12. And the Bible says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another. You know what that phrase means? Putting up with each other. Do you ever look at each other and say, okay, we got to put up with each other? That's what he says, forbearing one another. And what's the next thing? Oh, you can say it stronger than that. What does it say? Forgiving. Forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Any loopholes in that? I don't see any. Go to the book of Ephesians with me, chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 32. Ephesians 4, 32, the Bible says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted. What's your next phrase? Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. In Romans 5, 8, the Bible says that God committeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ didn't say, I'll die for you if. Or when you try to get things right. Well, then I'll consider dying for you. Then I'll consider, no. While we were yet sinners, while we were still the offender, Christ died for us. Before we ever came on the scene, folks, Christ died for us. You say, well, Christ died for all my sins, past, present, and future. No, that's not exactly right. Weren't all of your sins future when he died for you? Anybody over 2,000 years old? Okay, so they were all future. Christ died for all of our sin before we even were on planet Earth. He had already offered that forgiveness. Now, tonight as we read this, we don't see any wiggle room for having an unforgiving spirit. There's just none that the Lord gives us. I, I know we'd like it, wouldn't we? And we all struggle with this from time to time because we, we want to kind of fold our arms and say, no, I don't want to forgive. I don't want to. You know, do we have that option? Do we have that choice? No, not according to the Scripture. There's no way I have time to get into all the little nuances of the application, but let me, um, let me just give you a couple of points tonight. The first point is this. There is a difference between forgiveness supplied versus forgiveness applied. There's a difference between forgiveness supplied versus forgiveness applied. Christ died for our sins when? 2,000 years ago. When did that get applied to our account? When we trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's when what was supplied got applied. And you say, well, what does that mean then for my relationships with other people? Well, Jesus built the bridge for reconciliation. Guess what? We're supposed to build the bridge for reconciliation. But Jesus didn't go across that bridge and drag us across. He didn't say, I'm going to build the bridge, and I'm going to go across, and you're going to get forgiven because I'm going to force you to be forgiven, and I'm dragging you back across that bridge. No. Kind of like the prodigal son and the father. Did the father go into the other town looking for him? No. But when the son is coming up the road, who did he see? He sees his dad. You know, I, I, I believe dad met him somewhere along that road. And as that boy hit his knees and says, oh, dad, I don't deserve to be called your son. Call me a servant. I, I don't even deserve it. And he just wraps his arms around him. The Lord's the one who made the, the road of reconciliation. He created that bridge. And the moment that we will trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we do not find a Savior with his arms crossed and angry at us. We see his arms open, ready to welcome us home. That is absolutely amazing to think about. 
But you know what? The Bible says, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you, that's how we're supposed to forgive other people. It doesn't mean that I'm rushing across that bridge to drag them back over. You say, well, I have to do that, don't I? No. That's not what the Bible even presents. It's about getting your own heart right and being ready so that when the time comes, you can say, I've already forgiven you. You know, you read the story about Corrie ten Boom and the things that she went through and how, she, how God taught her to forgive the people that had raped her sister and had tortured her and her sister and the things that had been done to them while they were in the prison camps and all of that and how she was able to forgive and to hug the individual who had done these things. Only God can make it possible to do stuff like that. That is an act of God. Here's the second thing. Perhaps you think that the other person's sin against you was too great to forgive. The last verse that we saw here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, says that even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Why did God forgive us? Did God forgive you or I because we're just so wonderful? Because we just are in the right country or the right economic bracket or the right educational level or, or we were at least attending the right church. Is that why God forgave us? God forgave us for His Son's sake. Don't ever forget that, Christian. You and I were saved for Jesus' sake. I mean, that's a loving Father that would do something like that. Well, you mean for Jesus' sake? Jesus died for us. He paid for our salvation in His blood. The power of His resurrection offers us new life, a life. So tonight, when we stop and we think, what was it that put Jesus on the cross? Our sins. Every one of us, we had our hands on the hammer that nailed the nails into His hands and His feet. Every one of us had our hands on the crown of thorns that was thrust down upon his, his scalp. Every one of us was gathered around the cross, parting his garments and mocking him. Every one of us had our hands on the sword that was thrust into his side. Every one of us had a part in that. Because it was because of you and I and because of our sin that Jesus went to Calvary's cross. Every one of us. Tonight, what has anybody, what has anybody done to you or I that is worse than what we did to Jesus. I mean, think about it. What has anybody done to us that even comes close to what was done to Jesus? The answer is nothing. I'm not minimizing your pain. I'm not suggesting that what was done against you was egregious. I am not suggesting that at all. In fact, I'll just go right out on the limb and I will say it was awful what they did to you. It was vile. It was filthy. It was brutal. It was savage. It was uncalled for. It was despicable. It was heinous. It was any kind of bad adjective you can put on it. I'll put it on there. I'll agree with you. Was it worse than what you did to Jesus and what I did to Jesus? And the answer is no. So then why can I not forgive? Why can I not let go and create a bridge of reconciliation? That doesn't mean that I'm just blanket forgiving somebody, but I'm going to create a bridge. That's hard to do, isn't it? Because you know what our flesh wants? Our flesh wants a piece of flesh. Theirs. <laughs> now we want to see them suffer we want to see them hurt we want to see them go through at least what they put us through we want retribution we want revenge we want whatever we want them to pay for what they did to us sure i'm glad jesus didn't say that to me because had he said that to me i'd be in hell do you realize why hell is eternal? Because a person will not have been in hell a million years and they still will not have been able to pay what one drop of blood of Jesus paid. 
and they will be in hell forever. Um, Christians, that's something that we've got to come to grips with. Now, back to what the Apostle Paul said for this person. Now, put this into context. We are dealing with an individual in a church who has committed incest. They have been punished by the church. Paul says it's sufficient. Let off of them. Now forgive them. Not only that, but he says comfort them. The word is parakaleo, to come alongside of, comfort them. And then he says, confirm your love for them. He didn't just say love them, because you know how we would do, respond to that, right? All right, love you. Yeah, I love them. Okay, I'll admit it. There, I said it. It's out. Now let's just go on our way and forget it. No, he says confirm it. How do you confirm your love? How do you confirm your love for your spouse, which you did for sweetest day? And every day of the year, not just sweetest day, how do you confirm it? You love indeed, not just words. Deed. You do something, right? I'm not asking if you did something, but you do something. You do little acts of love and kindness for them because you confirm it. You can't just roll over in the morning and say, oh, morning, love you, and go out your door. Well, I told them. Or like some will say, well, I told them that at the altar. That ought to be good enough. If anything changes, I'll let you know. It doesn't work that way. Confirm it. And, and listen, married couples, confirm it daily. Confirm it multiple times a day. Parents, Confirm it to your kids multiple times a day. Kids, woohoo! confirm it to your parents multiple times a day that you love your mom and dad. Amen? Eh, okay, we'll work on that. Confirm it. Confirm it to the person. Why? Here's the last point tonight. The safety of forgiveness. Verses 10 and 11 of 2 Corinthians again. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Do you realize unforgiveness gives the devil room to work in your life? You gave him the foothold. You gave him a place to get in there to worm his way you got to forgive. You say, well, how does that give him a place into your life? It makes your heart hard. It makes your attitude cold. It builds walls. Unforgiveness builds walls. You say, well, you got to. you got to defend yourself. Stop trying to defend yourself and let God handle things. Let God work some things out for a change. And you say, well, i got to do something. Okay, sit back and pray. Sit back and pray. Keep your attitude sweet. Keep your attitude, your heart soft. Because hardness and bitterness can creep in awful easy. Christians, we don't want that. Because as soon as we do that, and by the way, when we are unforgiving, we start committing the sin that Satan had right from the get-go. Satan said in his heart, I will. And then there's five things. I will this, I will this, I will this, I will this. And you're saying, I will get even. I will have my way. I will have my rights. I will have my, my whatever vindicated. I will, I will, I will, I will. Satan says, that's it. That's it. You're saying it good. Say it stronger. Say it like you mean it. Say it loud. And you ought to be able to feel the little forked tongue of the devil hissing in your ear. Like the serpent in the garden we got to say, no, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. You know, if Jesus Christ could hang from a cross, and you say, well, I'm not Jesus. I know, me neither. But if Jesus Christ, setting the example, could hang from a cross and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And we have never experienced anything anywhere close to what Jesus experienced. Surely, we can find it somewhere from the Lord already placed within our hearts to express God's forgiveness. Christians, I'm not suggesting this is easy. Don't get mad at me. 
I'm just giving you the scripture. You take it up with the Lord. I am not suggesting this is easy. And I'm not suggesting for one second that something has not legitimately been done wrong against you. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that we've got to keep our attitudes right because it's a dangerous thing when we don't. Maybe you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus as Savior. You know, there are people that have rejected Christ as Savior. (laughs) We just had an opportunity Friday. I don't think the gentleman was saved. Um, But a churchgoer. And burned by churches. Very unforgiving toward them. And the heart's hardened. You know how hard it is to talk to somebody about the Lord and to encourage them to do right when they have been burnt by church and they think they're right with the Lord, but they're not giving any evidence to it. And you know what, lost soul, tonight you could be here and you're saying, I am going to be unforgiving towards this person that called themselves a Christian and that church that did this and that and the other and all that kind of stuff. You know what, tonight, lost soul, it's not about accepting Christians. It's not about accepting this church. It's about accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. You can die and go to hell without the church and without that particular Christian. But you cannot go to heaven without Christ. You need Jesus. Jesus died on a cross for your sins because he loved you. And he knew all your sin. Your heart is wicked and deceitful above all things. The Bible says Jesus loves you. He died for you. He rose from the grave. And tonight, lost soul, Jesus wants to save you. Would you allow him to do that tonight? Would you give us an opportunity to introduce you to the Lord Jesus Christ? Stand with me, please, tonight as we close. Father, the invitation is yours. Our hearts, Lord, we want to leave before you. And Lord, maybe as a believer in Christ, there are areas of unforgiveness that need to be addressed before you this evening. Maybe tonight, Lord, as a, as a Christian, maybe somebody needs to not only hear the, the words that they have been forgiven, they've gone through the, the right steps, they have shown that they are repentant. We need to not just receive them back in fellowship and tell them that they are loved in our life, but Lord, we need to confirm it. Lord, there might be somebody here that doesn't know Jesus as Savior. You know our hearts. Have your way, we pray and ask in Jesus' name.